We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this um, session. Um, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this session, which will focus on imagining the future of internet governance. This session is the result of a series of regional multi-stakeholder conversations that have happened in the past weeks in Asia, Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Derechos Digitales, the Latino American Association of Internet, Policy, Kiktanet, Dot Asia, and Abnit, and is co organized by the Association for Progressive Communications, APC, and the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, CIDA. So let me brief you um, present the agenda uh, for the session. So if we can perhaps um, show the slide, please. Um, thank you. The next one, thank you. So we will look at the past to imagine the future. And we are very glad that we have you all here with us for this collective exercise. I could also uh, like to invite you all to please use the chat uh, to share your views along the session, to participate in the conversation or to ask questions. We will be following your inputs in the chat and we will address them in the last part of the, of the session. And in order to, um, to start the session, I would like to introduce you to Frederick uh, Westerholm from SIDA. Frederick is a senior program manager and a specialist in democracy and human rights, freedom of speech. And Frederick will offer us some opening remarks and will help us to frame the session. So welcome again. And Frederick, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, be able to, to uh, give you some opening remarks of, uh, for this uh, workshop important workshop i would say for those of you who don't know me i'm uh, uh, on a sh very quick notice i replaced uh, anna karefeld who is a colleague of mine but she uh, on a very late notice she she she, she was hindered to to join so I, I i i'm replacing her here in this uh, workshop well as opening remarks i cannot foresee the future, although we are hopefully looking a little bit into the crystal ball. Uh, although I want to emphasize that CEDAS and Sweden's take on internet and digitalization, both now and in the future, should continue to create opportunities to expand uh, enjoyment of fundamental human rights, such as freedom of expression and opinion, freedom of assembly, and has uh, and that will have the opportunity to enable the economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, I we want it to enable development, but also exacerbate uh, existing social, political, and, and and economic divides. This is important for us, and uh, also strengthen people belonging to vulnerable groups such as women or, or religious minorities and those in vulnerable situations uh, in poverty or conflict situation uh, who are most impacted by, by uh, the internet. However, digitalization, you know, as well as all of us, uh, can also pose threats to human rights. This is uh, such as the right to privacy. We should all be aware of this discussing the future security is key and it's a core issue for us uh, as sida and sweden 
CEDA and our partners, we have uh, focused and supported many initiatives aimed at securing a free, open and secure internet central to digitalization, both in terms of gaining access to the internet, but also in relation to how it's used and regulated. So IGF, what role should and could the IGF play is, is also a question for this workshop uh, in advancing global digital cooperation. Well, I can only say inclusiveness. This forum is, is unique, as I understand, including civil society, all kinds of stakeholders as, as the states and, and, and the private companies. I think we all should be equal parts of this discussion, uh, being equal human beings in, in, in this world. And I think it's even more important now to, to, to uh, uh, give all of us equal space in the discussion. So uh, how does internet governance need to change is the main question in order to, to meet the changing nature and role of internet. What tools, mechanism, and capacity building instruments are needed for us stakeholders to effectively cooperate and engage in internet governance? Well, as I said already, I don't have the answers, but I do think the answers are with all of us in this room, and I, I really look forward to hearing the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frederick. Definitely democratizing internet governance is still a challenge ahead, and we really hope that by identifying together what has to change in the future towards having an open, free, and decentralized internet, uh, we can all work together around that. And the IGF has a key role to play in that regard. That is why I, I would like to invite next Henriette Esterhuisen the IGF MAC chair and one of the most experienced advocates for democratic, transparent, inclusive, accountable and multi-stakeholder internet governance. And yet, um, before we uh, move to look at the future, we would like to take a stock on internet governance development so far. So please share your views with us of the past and how we have got to this point. So welcome, Andriette. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Valeria. Um, I have to confess that my laptop is dead and I can't find a PowerPoint, so all my notes are not available to me. So I will try to remember them. Um, the, to take stock where we are, that is, you know, I think that we we started off, when I say we, I'm, I'm, I'm using um, it in the sense of the very early... Um, um, collection of, I think, individual social movements, activists, academics who started thinking about internet governance. Many of them were part of the communications rights movement in, in the 1990s. And, and, and I think it was also a time when there was an active debate about global governance, particularly around finance. Um, some of you are too young to remember, but there was a debate about the World Bank, the Inter International Monetary Fund. There was a sense that global governance was disconnected from, from, from what people really need. And, and so when this discussion about global internet governance emerged, I think we, we, we saw this as an opportunity to reshape global governance and in a different way, in a way that was really bottom-up, that was uh, really shaped by um, not outsiders, but the people that were inside um, creating and building the internet and, and creating content and, and shaping the internet. And I think then, you know, that shifted um, <laughs> in many ways. And, and I think what, what, we've, what we've, I think we've retained a spirit of that. I think the IGF represents that. But I think what the IGF um, and internet governance now has to negotiate, and I think it's challenging for, 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 for internet governance as, as we know it, it has to negotiate the interest of states. And the interest of states is coming from different places. It's these days very often coming from the cybersecurity space. It's very driven by lack of trust between states. Um, um, lack of, of very solid cooperation um, frameworks. 
Um, there's, of course, emerging uh, areas of consensus. It's then also coming from the place of states um, that are authoritarian, fearing the internet, um, fearing the use of the internet uh, by, by activists, by civil society, by citizens um, in political processes, for example. And then there's the, the presence of the corporate sector, which has um, used this, this um, open platform in a way to build immense power, but also power that the public sphere depends on. And I think that's one of the big paradoxes uh, and, and challenges for internet governance is how do you govern an internet that continues to play this role of establishing and operating as a kind of commons and, and a public sphere when so much of what is used um, to, to, to facilitate that is actually um, controlled and provided by corporations at an immense cost when it comes to um, surveillance, to, to the violation of your your sovereignty as an individual. And, 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 and are we talking about that? Yes, we are. But we're also talking about the sovereignty of states. And I think we're talking about that in a way that doesn't actually create a more just global governance system. I think it just creates perhaps a more statist system. And I think we still haven't found a way of really protecting the publicness, the, commons, the commons um, that the internet is and should be, having governments at the table playing an enabling role, um, containing the power of corporations while also utilizing the creativity and the resources of corporations. So, um, um, Valeria, <laughs> I, think, I think in terms of democratization, maybe, because maybe all this complexity and all this tension and, and does in fact represent a kind of, of democratization. Inclusive? No, I think we, we don't have inclusive internet governance yet. Um, and I think that is definitely um, something that we, we need to think about how to do it. And I think we need to unpack what it really means. I think we use the language of inclusion um, in internet governance too loosely. I think we, we've gone beyond where we can just use it without really unpacking it, being very specific about who should be included, who's excluded, when, why, about what. Um, that was unprepared, Valeria. I hope it wasn't too long. Back to you. Um, thank you so much, Anhyet, um, for the provocations for providing us an overview of what has been achieved so far. It really helped us to set a scene, uh, really to look at the future by taking stock of uh, what happened or of the lessons learned and the success stories. Um, and really looking at the future is at the core of this session and of the initiative in which it is inserted. We have heard so many international actors that um, we have reached an inflection point in relation to digital issues um, and their governance. So what we have seen today is, and yet was describing, is also a multiplication of processes of fora at the global level that seek to frame and regulate digital technologies, not to mention the regulatory impetus that uh, is taking place at the national level. And um, what we see is that there's always a consultation open to tomorrow, a new draft bill in relation to which we need to react by next week. There's a treaty that can have a huge impact on rights that is coming up next year. Uh, and, and what happens is that in this context, we really lack the time and the mind space to place ourselves outside of this convulsed environment um, to look further ahead. We lack opportunities to turn off the reactive mode, um, allowing us to be more proactive. And uh, this is the proposal of the Futures Initiative to provide the spaces and resources to allow us to imagine and plan for different futures um, and for uh, possibly to be more strategic, to be more targeted and more coordinated in our advocacy for a uh, different internet governance and internet governance that at APC we believe should be promoting social and environmental justice, human rights and feminist uh, futures. So 
bottom line, this session is really part of a broader project that we started um, with some exercises carried out with APC staff and members. And we also organized regional workshops uh, with partners in Africa, in Asia and Latin America, as was mentioned by Valeria at the beginning. Um, with them, we initiated this process of imagining what global internet governance will look like 10 years from now. Of course, 10 years from now is far, but it's not that far away. So the seeds for what will be in 10 years are already here. Our first step, therefore, was really to identify the key trends that are observable today. And this is what we did in the regional workshops. So what we'll do now is to invite our co-organizers to present some of the highlights for each of the regional workshops. And we'll later on in the session build on these trends and we'll go back to Henriette to look at the future after providing us this uh, so rich look into the past. So I'll invite now Jamila Venturini from Derechos Digitales, who will be presenting the highlights for Latin America. Barack Otieno from Dictanet, who will be presenting the highlights for Africa. And Jennifer Shang from Dot Asia, who will be presenting the highlights for Asia. Um, and I think we could start with you, Jamila. Um, so on to you. Thank you, Paula. Um, I'll be very quick, uh, sharing that the Latin American Internet Governance Community is willing to a future that has gender equality, sustainability and environmental protection as fundamental pillars for tech development and deployment. They are concerned about the increased divides that affect, um, uh, affect the region after the pandemic and with the widespread production and consum consumption of tech devices. And they want to develop actions that leads us to a different future that is little likely to occur if things continue as they are right now. Increased surveillance and government control of internet at different layers and of shutdowns are scenarios that they believe are probable, while they think if very little is very little likely that people decide to completely disconnect from the internet. There was little coincidence among the group on the future of multi-stakeholder institution and fora, including possible capture of the IGF by state actors, for instance. And this might be due to a variation on the perceptions of different actors from varied countries and sectors may have and the experience they had in such spaces. Finally, there was a concern around the role of global corporations in global economy and trade how virtual reality and the metaverse can increment existing social and polit political fragmentation and polarization, and how such fragmentation could then reflect on the technical internet infrastructure. A final call for building a more plural and di diverse internet governance was made with the inclusion of absent voices in the debates. Back to you. Thanks so much, Jamila. Barak, maybe we can go to Africa now? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Barack Otieno. Uh, I'll follow suit uh, very quickly. Uh, in the Africa region, uh, three key issues uh, came up, which I will uh, summarize. Uh, one of them was uh, obviously access. Um, of course, as uh, more and more people have come online, uh, courtesy of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has also been evident, particularly in the African region, that access remains a major area of concern and uh, we are likely to see a lot of effort uh, in this direction to ensure that more and more citizens have access to the internet. And uh, along with access is the issue of digital literacy uh, because uh, optimal use of the internet or optimal uh, access uh, can only be attained with a society that is digitally literate. So this is one of the key areas or key trends uh, that is likely to be seen. Uh, more and more people uh, uh, being uh, trained or capacity building initiatives that will uh, enable more people to uh, take advantage of the internet. Uh, the other trend that was discussed uh, was uh, the issue of uh, participation of government, governments in the internet governance arena. Uh, as more citizens come online, uh, the interest of government uh, is uh, increasing on matters internet governance. 
and uh, it's an area that um, uh, participants uh, felt would be worth uh, looking into. Uh, obviously, as many more citizens come online and government services come online, uh, the governments will pay a lot more attention on the governance of the internet uh, compared to the past where they may have uh, not been very keen on what was happening in uh, the internet governance arena or space. There was also a conversation around uh, whether the gender digital divide will widen uh, or narrow and uh, there seemed to be confess, consensus uh, that uh, with um, uh, the COVID propelled uh, digital transformation uh, the gender digital divide is likely to narrow as more and more citizens um, across different um, uh, demographics come online uh, uh, to take advantage of uh, the use uh, to take advantage of the internet so i would summarize those three uh, key areas as some of the important trends that were discussed uh, by the african groups uh, on uh, issues that are to watch out for thank you very much thanks to you barack and now we have jennifer and jennifer is in the room in poland yes thank you paula um, yes, this is Jennifer Chung, actually, in, in um, Katowice, Poland. Very happy to be here in the room and also to see all the colleagues in the Zoom room as well. So I'll present a little bit of uh, the trends that we did in the Asia-Pacific Regional Workshop. We had the advantage of actually being the last regional workshop to, to perform this exercise and had the good uh, fortune to look at the trends that were discussed both in the Latin American workshop as well as the African workshop. And of course, there's shared trends that we, we also looked at was, of course, access, cost of access. Uh, Asia Pacific is an extremely diverse region there. Uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, it was extremely difficult for many economies in the Asia Pacific region to have people continue in, in their daily lives, in, in education, in work. And uh, not surprisingly, there's also a big concern here as well that internet governance has a relationship with the political system. And a lot of countries in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific region as a whole are trending towards getting less democratic. So there's a concern here as well that government and big tech may have their own way of governing rather than looking at it in a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, surveillance was another thing that was uh, uh, talked about in, during their session. There are certain uh, states in, in the Asia Pacific region where this is a particular concern. And I think APC also did a, a study on internet shutdowns as well as the regulations that are affecting uh, different jurisdictions in, in Asia Pacific um, that will in, uh, affect internet freedoms as well. Another thing that is quite interesting that came up in our um, regional workshop was environmental sustainability. I think this has become an extremely important uh, topic, not just in our region, but also globally. And there was concern here that, you know, we need, really need to have this uh, focus uh, looking at internet governance issues with this lens to be in order to to keep this discussion sustain, sustainable, and then finally, and this is not not surprising at all, um, multilingual internet. There is a vast majority of the Asian uh, Asia Pacific countries where English is absolutely not the first language. There is a multitude of people who are unconnected, especially in the Asia Pacific region, where they cannot. Uh, understand or they don't have content in their local language and they would you know ask why why are we why should we connect to this this network what what is the benefits for us when the content there is not for us so here are the the main trends that we talked about um, in Asia Pacific back to you Paula thanks Jennifer and to Barack and Jamila uh, very interesting highlights coming from the different regions, uh, we can see a regional intake in some of the issues. And uh, what, as I mentioned to you, this is this session is part of a broader process. So what we did uh, after the um, regional workshops was to work on the trends, 
that were identified and build scenarios, scenarios for the future. So we have different scenarios and what we are going to do in this session today is to work on the projected scenario, the most probable scenario that came out of the trends that were just discussed with you and presented by our uh, regional partners. So to lead on the exercise, uh, please have uh, your minds and head uh, ready for, ready for, for uh, a hands-on uh, effort now. Um, I'm going to invite my colleague Roxana Bassi, who will be leading us on, on the exercise. Oh, Roxana, the baron to you. Yes, thank you, Paula. And thank you, everyone, for participating. I'm already reading your comments in the chat, and, and it's going to be a very interesting session. So the methodology we used uh, in order to develop the session for today is part of what's called prospective, so planning for the future. Uh, and it's not, it's not reading the future ball, right? Uh, it's not magic. But what I love about this methodology is this combination of science fiction in a way of opening up the mind to what is possible and what's even beyond the possible. And at the same time, a, a very contained uh, and complex methodology to observe the present, maybe the things that Henriette uh, shared with us, and how is the present taking us to the future? Right. So um, the methodology that we used, we identified a series of uh, what we call uh, indicators, trends, things that are happening and, and that lead into the future. And when we do perspective, when we do what's called scenario planning, we don't think of just one future. We analyze various f uh, different futures, right? Um, can we move on to the next uh, slide, Igor, please? So um, for our exercise today, we have selected just one of these futures. What will happen in 10 years if nothing really changes? So what is happening now, the trends that we're seeing now, are, we just extrapolate them into the future. We prolong them into the future. So again, this is not the one future that will happen. It's one of the possible future scenarios. But it's important because it is what we have detected uh, in the different workshops that we did as the most probable thing to happen. So we have built with the different trends a story. And we'd like to share with you that story um, so that we can think together about this future and what we like and don't like about it. So Vero, whenever you're ready, uh, we can start the video. The future we imagine is most probable. Avi wakes up on a beautiful, sunny morning of 2031. Her house teeming with internet-connected sensors and devices makes this process effortlessly smooth. She awakens to soothing music that gains tempo as she gets ready to start her day. Automatic heating and lights and machines that start preparing breakfast before she even reaches the kitchen. Avi, like the average person in her town, owns about 30 devices connected to the different internets she has access to. A tiny blip in the sea of billions of interconnected devices owned by cities, companies, and even cars. Many years ago, Avi used to participate in the IGF, a global open hybrid event where multi-stakeholder debates took place on how to better govern the then unified network of networks. But in the years since, the IGF became a space of politics and bureaucracy Locked in its own debate, it lost its power to influence internet governance processes. Because of this, internet governance has changed its focus, not anymore on people and their rights, but mostly about securing interoperability and interconnection among the myriad of devices and platforms. After many years of trying to agree on a common management framework for the internet, most of the world adopted a more divided and drastic approach. We now have hundreds of fragmented semi-interconnected networks. Some countries have even more than one. 
others connect to networks according to their religion, their status, or the company they work with. Not all networks are connected, and some are heavily controlled. Abby finishes her breakfast while one of her devices reads her news out to her. She remembers this format of news used to be called social media, but those lines of distinction make little sense to her anymore. The news she receives in her feed is very specific to her, and is determined by the restrictions on sources that her country has set. Her choice of trusted sources and her friends' choices and her reactions to each piece of news that her devices record and uses to curate tomorrow's news. Avi often worries that her friends trust the news they hear, read, and watch online too much. She also wonders if, even despite her skepticism, perhaps she trusts the news too much as well. It's become very hard to determine the truth in this deeply fake post-truth world. But finding truth online is low on most people's lists of concerns when connecting to the internet. Most people whom Avi knows face daily attacks on their devices, sensors and data. The fragmented internet's incoherent and disparate security policies have made cybersecurity threats far too sophisticated for most people to protect themselves from. Half the options to help protect you seem to attack you themselves, and the other options seem to demand too much from users to implement. So attacks have become almost the norm. It's not so much a question of have you been attacked or has your data ever been breached. It's a question of how many times this last year. The threats online don't stop there. Although Avi has access to hundreds of platforms and ways to express herself, she must be very careful about what she does or writes online. Surveillance of citizens has increased, and it's facilitated by internet fragmentation, lack of international norms, and unaccountable collusion by tech companies and states. She can never fully be sure that her private message or private post to a closed circle is really private at all. She's also acutely aware that too much expression makes network owners temporarily shut down their networks. Sometime later, Avi starts a work day. Like most of the people she knows, Avi works entirely from home, assisted by remote sensors and devices. After remote work became popular during the 2020 pandemic, forcing major changes in labor, there are now fortunately strong laws and practices that protect her rights and that of other remote workers, making them equal to any other worker. In her work, Avi makes use of the open data collected by the large number of connected devices and sensors. Much of the data today is shared openly by companies, governments, and others. All over the world, the collected data from systems and sensors is used by people and automated systems. And this open availability has helped improve and optimize the use of resources, as well as streamline many processes affecting human lives. Sometimes, Avi thinks of her world and how internet governance decisions made in the past years, or not made even, have affected her current life. And sometimes she wonders if things could have been different. Okay, we are back from a glimpse of the future. Hmm, how does it feel? We saw a future as identified in the different workshops as most possible from happening. It doesn't mean that this will be the future. It means that maybe it's the future if we don't act, right? Um, so this is 10 years from now. Is it a future that we like? Maybe we like parts of it? Are the parts of uh, or aspects that we don't like or that we can control and change? Definitely we can. And there are others that we cannot control. But what we can definitely do is plan a strategy, work towards changing this future, turning, turning it into a different future, hoping to modify it. Uh, into a future we would like to live in. 
So when we think about internet governance, internet governance has many dimensions, including economic dimensions, social, cultural, technical, and political aspects. We're going to work all together now in an exercise, uh, a collective exercise of changing this future. And for that, uh, we would like you to concentrate, to focus on the political and institutional dimension of internet governance. So when we're doing the exercise, think about the policies, the regulations, the accountability schemes, collaboration about the different players, the transparency and openness. What can we do to change this future? And the way we're going to work uh, all together is uh, on four different mirror boards. So on this board, we would like everyone to work together, inputting your different ideas of what we could act, how we can act and change this future in order to achieve a future that is more aligned to the protection of human rights, to the promotion of social and environmental justice, and to promoting feminist futures. So what could you be doing? Thinking again, going back to the political and institutional dimension of internet governance. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Igor? So these are four different mirror boards and there are four links there for you to access. And the idea is that you access them according to your main stakeholder group, okay? Uh, and the idea is that you access the board there and you start adding sticky notes, ideas of actions from, from your place, from your organization, uh, from your stakeholder group of things we could do. And when you access the boards, there's a, a note uh, that you can access by clicking on like a note icon on the top right, where you can see a summary of the different trends. And Igor, if you move just forward one, one more uh, slide, we can show you. So that story that we heard all together actually comes from these different trends, mm -hmm. the different trends identified in the different workshops. All these trends are copied there in the mirror boards for you to review and keep them in mind. So would you like to, um, support the development of these trends or would you like to combat these trends and the idea is that you put your your own ideas for action in the uh, mirror boards and we'll go back to the mirror board please to the links back one Igor so now we have exactly 20 minutes to work together so I invite you all uh, to access the board according to your stakeholder group and start adding ideas. And we'll be um, sharing them after these 20 minutes. And always keep in mind, we're talking uh, about the political and institutional dimension of internet governance. So what could we be doing in these specific policy and institutional dimensions in order to change the future? Okay, you're invited to join the board Remember you have in the notes in the board, you have um, all these ideas. Oh, I see lots of visitors in the boards already. So you have a summary of the trends in the notes in, in case you need Brooks. to check them. <coughs> Brooks, just to clarify, so ideas uh, about actions, right? Actions, exactly. Actions, they can be short term, they can be long term, Always keeping on mind we're talking 10 years from now maximum, okay? We also have the links pasted in the chat in Zoom. Just for, for those of you in the room, you know there are 60 people online. 
So I think altogether we are more than 80 people in this um, session, about 20 people in the room. Yes, and I see already some ideas coming to life in the different mirror boards. Um, please remember that you can also, besides inserting new ideas and moving them around, you can connect them with other related ideas. So for us, for those that have just joined, um, there are instructions here of joining one of the four boards according to your stakeholder group and entering ideas for changes, for things you want to do in order to change the future, the most probable future we saw in the video. You can also see uh, some references and the trends in the notes in the mirror board in the top right corner of the board. So I, we have 12 minutes left and I see a lot of activity on some of the boards with lots of very interesting ideas and connections flowing. Very nice.
please remember if you want to review the trends that we use to build the story of the future, they are in the notes in the mirror board on the top right uh, corner of the board. So we have seven minutes left of these uh, exercises we're all doing together in the mirror boards. 
And some of the boards are becoming quite intense with lots of ideas and arrows connecting the ideas. It's great. Uh, and happy to see also the government um, group starts working on ideas as well. So excellent work. I can see a lot of is happening in all the boards. Uh, we only have two minutes left. And then we have rapporteurs who will tell us uh, a few highlights of what they see on the boards, highlights and trends and ideas.
Okay, everyone, uh, our time is up to work on the boards. So, of course, you can continue entering ideas like connecting arrows. And now we're going to start um, sharing with you some of the main highlights from different rapporteurs. And I would like to uh, invite Jamila, if you would like to start with what you saw in the government board. Jamila? Yes, Roxana, of course. I was here systematizing. It is very interesting. I organized it in some topics. The first one I would highlight is human rights. So they mentioned human rights based protocols. And I believe that um, could involve the different internet layers. And it's related to a call that they also uh, mentioned for the active engagement of standard setting bodies and the discussions around internet government. Um, also, they mentioned implementing an Internet Bill of Rights to be adopted by status, which leads us to a question on how they would dialogue with other human rights commitments that already exist and with which states are already uh, committed to. Um, the second topic has to do uh, related to the first one with international law orienting um, norms based order for the cyberspace and a responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Um, three other points, one, on the, one of them has to do with participation. Um, there is a mention on technology acting as a mean to facilitate participation from global South countries in international negotiations. Uh, another for opening multilateral spaces for multi-stakeholder participation and including young people in decision-making processes. Another point for on coordination that I think is very interesting and has to do with a call for better connection between regional and global processes. Another call for more coordination among different state agencies dealing with digital issues. And I guess that would also apply to international organizations. And finally, uh, a point on capacity building at the regional level and focus on emerging technologies. I hope I could systematize it, summarize it well and um, open if you want to complement on the chat or further explore any point on the chat. Back to you, Roxanne. Yeah, amazing, right? So much to do, so many ideas. Um, okay, uh, Jennifer, if you want to talk about the technical community. Thank you, Roxana. A little bit of a technical issue with the mic in the room as well. Um, so the technical community board is actually quite filled, as you see. We are a wordy bunch here. Um, I've tried my best to enlarge the font size so I can read it on my screen. Hopefully you can also read it on your screen or go to the Miro board to look at it in more detail. I've also tried to organize it in a way that I can you know, see the groupings. There's a first grouping that talks about AI. There is a talk, um, point about be building an AI fact checker uh, to implement AI sentries to identify and mitigate threat actors. Um, there's also talk about advocating use for VPNs for all internet activity and advocating states to abide by cyber norms. 
And then there's a whole group in here about cooperation within the technical community about implementing HTTPS by default and also consolidating the fragmented internet standards development and promote hyper-local root instance developed by the IETF and a greater cooperation among the certs across boundaries. There's also a note here to make sure that the evolution of the technical policy making processes are more inclusive and also more resilient to capture or take over. Uh, the technical community wants the stakeholders to understand and respect the work of the technical community more. Uh, I guess this is why we are here, right? And then also bring people back to the center of internet governance discussions. Uh, finally, we're looking at the human rights lens here. Uh, they want the conversations, to have conversations and develop guidelines to, for practices to combat misinformation and disinformation, to promote human-centered design and innovation, and also embed the multi-stakeholder model in innovation to ensure that products and services uh, address societal needs. Um, there's one last thing I wanted to bring out is to focus on the environmentally friendly technical solutions built on locally available material with local resources. Back to you, Roxana. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to categorize the input because everything connects with everything else, yeah. right? And then also among the stakeholder groups. Um, so Gilbert, if you want to go ahead with, with civil society, and you have a hard one because there's so many ideas in there. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, it's basically very uh, busy on this board here, but some of the few highlights that I can point out that really stands out on this board, uh, the issue of capacity building, and this capacity building cuts across from um, uh, government, but also to civil society in terms of civil society advocating for a more uh, human right based uh, internet space. Uh, there's also uh, a ban on surveillance on, uh, on a global level. Uh, that is something that also kind of uh, stands out on this board. Uh, there's um, a component of uh, having, uh, solving an anonymity uh, problem. So meaning uh, anonymous usage of the internet being uh, solved. Uh, there's also um, a huge component of making sure that big tech uh, are very responsible for uh, how they collect data, but also issue of data protection that also stands out uh, on this board. Um, building a more community network, uh, meaning strengthening uh, different uh, aspects of or different regions within uh, which uh, different uh, individuals utilize uh, the internet. Uh, there's also promotion of uh, privacy, uh, which is also uh, cuts into the issue of surveillance. Um, again, uh, this board is very, <laughs> is very busy, so I get off time to check it out. And then there's a ban on uh, uh, on harmful uh, utilization of uh, or weaponizing uh, the internet um, that also stands out, which brings back the issue of surveillance. So capacity building, surveillance, uh, making sure that big tech uh, are more accountable uh, is what really stands out on this uh, board. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um... Very, very interesting and a lot to read and process. And like Valeria said, there's there are like next steps of this process and she will share information about that soon. So uh, Raul, if you want to talk about the private sector and what you've seen in the... Okay, thank you, Rox. Um, first of all, I, I, I collected a, a set of uh, recommendations and ideas that are related to the uh, to policy development and, and governance itself, like uh, mechanisms for getting high level agreements on given uh, topics, uh, consistency, the need of consistency uh, between national objectives and specific uh, policies, 
in I think it's in every country. Uh, the use of sandboxes as a regular normal tool, the um, development of new legislative models with the participation of all stakeholders uh, since the beginning of the discussions, the more uh, analysis of impact as, in the, as part of the policy development process, as uh, government commitments to the, um, with the multi-stakeholder model, uh, some focus on small, medium, and, and micro enterprises in both sense, in, in the sense of uh, innovation, mission-oriented innovation as, um, with regard to SMS, and also in the sense of uh, giving or create, creating more incentives uh, for the participation in discussions of small and medium enterprises. As, uh, also, is uh, is uh, market the, the need of not uh, not a single um, regulation approach globally, and the need of uh, each region to develop their own approaches based on needs and objectives and reality. And there are some things that are more more specific, like uh, the need of uh, innovative approaches to connectivity, innovative from the point of view of technology, regulation, and public policy. The, the need of not, uh, not fragmented internet, uh, international agreements that allow uh, flow of data and data sharing as based on the respect of uh, rights of the users. And um, the, there is a one comment that I don't, I didn't understand exactly. The but uh, it speaks about bill of responsibilities and accountability. I guess that it refers to to companies. Um, the the provide develop and creating safeguards uh, for critical infrastructure. There's commitments, I guess, uh, with regard to not attack and not harm the the infrastructure. And um, that's all from my side. Thank you so much, Jamila, Raul, Gilbert, Jennifer, for the reports. There's so many relevant ideas that are also very telling about how we, the different stakeholders, see our roles in shaping the future. Now, in order to close the circle of the reflection, and, uh, and also in order to build bridges between um, the past and the future, I would like to invite Andriette again to share her view of uh, what the commonalities are among all the stakeholder groups and also how do you contrast, Andriette, these suggested actions coming from the groups with your initial intervention that look at the past. So, Andriette, I'm really willing to hear you. Valeria, I think this is APC's revenge against its ex-executive <laughs> director. Was I such a terrible boss for all of those years that you are having make me to do this? But it's a fascinating exercise. And so, really, congratulations to Rox. I know she loves this method and to all of you for doing this. Well, the first thing that struck me is that different things do come out of different stakeholder groups. Now... And I think that reinforces the need for multi-stakeholder processes. Maybe we can do them better or do them differently. But in principle, you do get a richer set of perspectives and a more diverse and challenging set of perspectives if you draw them um, from different stakeholder groups. I'll just say a little bit about what struck for me. So I think governments, clearly, there was a lot of emphasis on standards, norms, laws. Um, partnership, tech, very solution oriented, and actually also harnessing technology to, to help solve the problems created by technology, which might then create more problems, but at the same time is very creative um, response. Um, and then um, civil society, um, everything, which is what normally happens with civil society, but I think what was different there was more of an emphasis on the need for capabilities, for capacity, and and for um, and also a recognition of gaps. Um, I think definitely, uh, and then in private sector, I think very interesting. I saw the word frameworks, 
And it really, it stands out to me that I think what you see from the private sector is the need for predictability, the need for, for policy. In re and, and in some ways, if you just did a very uh, superficial analysis of this, I think the private sector mirror board was the most regulation friendly of all of them, um, because I think that is predictable. And cross-border regulation is that that's harmonizes across borders is very important for business. It's very hard for business to, to have to articulate its work to so many different environments. Sorry, I'm working on my phone. So what stood out for me and what can I don't have solutions at all. I think the one thing that really stood out for me though in all of the boards was a lack of recognition or consideration of the offline world. I think maybe we are also immersed in this world of the internet. That even in the context of the pandemic, we stop imagining or considering, in fact, how even though the internet is so powerful and technology is, is, is so endless and, and creative, that things can happen in the world. And those things happen every day. They happen to people that are offline, that are not um, online yet. And they happen to those of us that are online. And I think that part of the Internet Governance Project is to always retain some kind of sensibility that the Internet is not an alternative reality. It is rooted in geopolitical conflicts and social inequalities, um, in, in, in natural disasters that can happen, in, in environmental disasters. So I think, I mean, there was a reference to climate change, um, Jennifer, in your, in your um, group. Um, so I think, what, what do I read from this? I think that we, we there's, there's, still, there's, there's an enthusiasm, there is um, different approaches, um, there is a lot of identification of both the challenges and the opportunity. And it feels to me that we still really are in many ways at the beginning of coming to terms of how to approach internet governance. But there were some things that stood out. I think there was the understanding, quite a few of the boards talked about the need for some kind of global agreement, global consensus, norms on, on what the internet is, how we should think about it and, and how it should be governed. And I think that does create a bridge for us to, to, to uh, or a set of bridges to, um, work with. And certainly, I think what these boards indicate to me is that this is not a finite, you know, in internet governance and establishing internet governance that does respect those categories that the APC team put up for us, which were human rights, and I can't remember them all. Um, um, Paula, maybe you can just read them, the, 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 the considerations. Yeah. Human rights, social and environmental justice, and feminist futures. Exactly. So to keep those in mind, it's an ongoing process. It's continuous. And I think we need to look at evidence. We need to be willing to go into the space of norms and laws and, and regulation, but in a way that definitely doesn't um, undermine or harm the interoperability. Um, of the internet, and that helps us achieve that. So there's a lot of work for us to do, basically, um, and to bring different perspectives together. Sorry, it was an impossible task, but thanks for a really um, um, interesting, challenging exercise. On the contrary, thank you so much, Andriette. I think you have highlighted what is needed, and and and, and really, you know, this exercise, as you were as you are pointing out, we are at the beginning coming at terms of what is needed next in terms of internet governance. So this is so timely and all your ideas are so welcome. So thank you, Andrea, for, for that effort. And by the way, you were a fantastic boss. That's no doubt of that. <laughs> um, I, at this point of the session, I could like to check with, with uh, Veronica about the comments in the chat. As we offer, we would like to address some of the comments or at least, you know, give them a space. So, Vero, if you can share with us what has been happening in the chat in terms of the reflections and ideas there. Hi, Valeria. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah. So, if other comments uh, arise, I, I will take a look at the chat. So, some of the comments that I've been uh, checking, uh, some comments from Andrew. One, civil society is either very creative, productive, or very chaotic, which is true. 
uh, but he also mentioned um, that given the level of maturity of the internet, we are all well beyond the point where there is a need for actual governance uh, as well as dialogue. Talking about at the beginning, we were talking about the, the IGF role and um, Andrew raises the issue of maybe the proposed IGF leadership panel could play a positive role in ensuring this. Um, there was also a comment in the chat which, um, about the need of linking the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples with, with internet um, governance frameworks and, and policies. Um, there were some comments about the link to the video that we uh, share about these tensions uh, regarding open data and innovation and the privacy concerns that we're also addressing the in several boards. Um, some comments about not uh, a lot of comments and discussion on, on relevant UN processes, as, as for example, some connected with cybersecurity issues, which I think, yeah, we didn't talk a lot about the UN role and these discussions. Those are some of the comments that I read. I, maybe, I think Nicolas mentioned something, he, he wanted to bring something. So Nicolas, if you are there and want to, to type in the chat, any final comments or reflections? Um, otherwise, I think uh, we are done with the comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vero, and thank you everyone for the comments. As we have been mentioning, this session is just a part, one more step in a broader initiative. So there are going also to be more opportunities in the future for you to engage and to continue this reflection. And that's precisely what I want to refer uh, to uh, next. Um, so when, uh, as I mentioned, this session is part of this broader initiative that Paula mentioned to you that seeks to put in motion uh, a strategic creative process that, that will contribute to a better and hopefully more nuanced understanding of what internet governance should look like or be in the future to respond to the users needs and rights and to also respond to the structural challenges expressed in the online space as a result of what Henriette was saying, this continuum between the offline and the online. Uh, we, will, we will be producing a report based on the outcomes of this session and we will be also undertaking some research additional interviews, additional global and regional conversations in the first part of uh, 2022, in the first half of the year, oriented to create uh, a strategic framework to engage in advocacy and movement building and, and stakeholder partnerships around internet governance and digital cooperation. So our, our goal is not only to collect the feedback, marked by this plurality and this diversity of views um, coming from the different stakeholders, but also to contribute to a strengthen a movement that uh, possibly could lead uh, to increase agreement, synergy and coordination in the work of the different stakeholders around internet governance. So we really expect you to see, uh, to, to really expect to see you around the activities that we are going to be planning next and to help us to keep identifying the key ideas, stakeholders, bottlenecks and also the convergent spaces concerning internet governance models and visions for the future. A, an important reference to this work will be the run up uh, to the WSIS plus 20 celebrations, um, but, uh, but also the negotiations around the global di digital compact and, and all the processes happening uh, at the UN level with the roadmap for digital cooperation and so on and the strengthening of the IGF. So we really want to connect with all those processes. So thank you also for the other ideas that came, came up in the session about the processes that we should be connecting with. So if you want to keep involved and um, if you want to know more about the process of this initiative, if you have questions as well about the next steps, um, I can offer you the contact of my colleague Paula Martins, paula at apc.org. Paula leads our global policy advocacy work and would be very happy to provide you with more details or to respond to questions that you might have. And with that, I think that um, uh, we are ready to close the session. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And thank you to SIDA and to our regional partners 
for the work and the and the input I, um, and your leadership on, on on this area. We really look forward to see you around the activities that are coming um, next year. So thank you very much. in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We are all united. united.